Um, thank you all. What a great group. And I have been coming to this series um, for a while, so it's my honor to participate in, um, and, and spend this evening with y'all. So thank you for being here. So um, I wanted to um, first start by giving kind of an overview of some of the things that I'm doing on local refuges here with many of you in the room, um, lots of staff, lots of volunteers, lots of community members. So this is a, it's sort of a group um, energy and a group dynamic and I'm grateful for your participation as well. I think one of the more complicated things that I've found coming into um, working for a federal agency is understanding how it's organized. So I thought I would give a little bit of context for the Fish and Wildlife Service in general before I get into some of the um, science and monitoring on, sort of on and in these places. And then I'm gonna highlight um, a couple specific research projects that are kind of near and dear to me. So the first sort of level of organization is at the departmental level. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is part of the Department of Interior. It's, um, it has quite a few uh, bureaus and agencies, some more recognizable than others. Um, locally, we also have Park Service here. But in addition to managing a lot of natural resources, this department is responsible for um, the administration of programs related to Native Americans, uh, Native Alaskans, Hawaiians, different tribal and territory issues as well. And what I found so fascinating is within this country, the Department of Interior manages over 75% of federal public lands. So that's quite a few resources to be responsible for. The Fish and Wildlife Service also has a little bit of a complicated organization. It has a lot of different diverse programs in it including one that I'm gonna to highlight today, the refuge system. But listed here are some other, um, other programs, including the Division of Migratory Birds, Endangered Species Programs, in International Affairs, and even Wildlife for Forensics. Locally, we're at an advantage in Northeastern North Carolina because we actually have four different programs in the service represented. In addition to the refuges within the refuge system, we have an Office of Migratory Birds um, located in Columbia. We have Edenton National Fish Hatchery. And then we also have staff from the Endangered Species Program working in one of the sub-offices for ecological services. Those staff are co-located at um, sort of our refuge headquarters, but there's also uh, field offices that serve North Carolina in Raleigh and Asheville. So, the kind of star of our show tonight is the, the wildlife refuge system. So, how many of you have been to a national wildlife refuge? Awesome. How many of you have been to a national wildlife refuge outside of northeastern North Carolina? All right. So, uh, the wildlife refuge is, refuges are located across the country. That includes... Um, Alaskan, Hawaii, and the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. You can see that they're kind of clustered along the coast, at least in kind of our neck of the woods. Um, but overall, there's 560 and growing national wildlife refuges nationally. That's 150 million acres of federal public land for you to visit. And people do visit. Over 50 million visitors a year um, come to these areas, and that visitation rate generates over $1.6 million and creates 27,000 jobs annually in local areas through generating, um, excuse me, generating this income through recreational fees in local economies. The other thing that's in the wildlife refuge system is wildlife. So no surprise there, um, but it's a lot of wildlife. Um, over 700 species of birds, 1,000 species of fish, 200 species of mammals, 200 spe um, over 250 species of um, herps. 
But, uh, and that includes almost nearly 400 at risk or threatened and endangered species. I chose to actually highlight a couple things that don't get represented well, and that's the plants and the insects and invertebrates. We honestly have no idea how many of these groups are on refuges because they tend to be what I call charismatic microfauna and flora. They're just the small itty bitties and we don't really um, assign as much value as they deserve. So I wanted to feature a couple of my favorites here. What do we do on refuges? Well, the mission of the refuge system really mirrors the mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service more broadly, and that is to create a network of lands and waters for the American people by conserving and managing fish, wildlife, plants, and the habitats that they require. How do we do that? We use several different guiding principles. Um, first and foremost, we're land stewards. So we're managing the land in different ways. Sometimes that's just closing an area and having it be surely protected from whatever disturbances around it. Some of it's more active management, um, but whatever is necessary to sort of achieve those goals of the mission. There are wildlife dependent uses. Many of you are familiar with these, we call them the big six hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, photography, interpretation, and education. I am willing to bet most of you have engaged in these activities on a refuge because that's some of the reasons why we visit these places. Partnerships are key for us to meet our mission. Um, and I'm gonna go through several different projects that kind of outline that need specifically. And why I'm here tonight as part of the Science in the Sound series is we're a science-based organization. So I'm held to the same standards of scientific integrity and want to reflect that commitment through conservation, delivery, and management. Partnerships are key to our success. We're a small group of folks. Um, this is just a sampling of local partners that we interact with here in Northeastern North Carolina. What is not listed here are many of the academic institutions um, that I'll be highlighting as well. But um, these are some of our regular partners and players in the ongoing science and monitoring on refuges. So I wanted to first, before I get into some of the science, I wanted to talk about just the general benefits of wildlife refuges. Why are refuges important? Um, and I think many of these you all know, but I, I think it's worth going through um, specifically. So the first one is health. And what I mean by that is integrated health. Physical health, mental well-being, there is a growing body of research that supports the value of a strong nature health connection. I am better when I am working outside. <laughs> So I suspect it's that way with many of you as well. If you can take a break and take a walk and sort of enjoy some of these incredible environments that we're surrounded by. The second one is recreation. There are world-class recreational opportunities on National Wildlife Refuge. Hunting, fishing, paddling, hiking, bird watching, wildlife observation, photography. Storm resilience. This is becoming increasingly important because if you remember looking on that map where all those refuges are kind of across the country, a lot of them are coastal or um, adjacent to large river systems. This is really important as we continue to see impacts from changing weather patterns and flooding to how we work together in these coastal communities. So storm resilience, is um, really important because there are so many coastal refuges, but because they can also buffer and create resiliency in some areas. We still have a long way to go on this. So we have a lot of work to do, partnering in our community to create even more resiliency to be able to recover from some of these disturbances. Student enrichment. And this is something that the Coastal Studies Institute is um, paramount about. They uh, allow a lot of outdoor classroom activities. 
and refuges is the same way. This is, it's a, a ready to go classroom. In addition to this sort of living laboratory, there are a lot of um, educational programs that are available at different refuges, but also a lot of resources. Um, and everything from lesson plans to um, activity guides or curriculum planning. Uh, the next is reduced fire risk to surrounding communities. So we work together with local first responders in terms of emergency management, but we also work with very specific partners like the North Carolina Forest Service to be able to do things like prescribed burns. I know it's, it's, uh, it sometimes seems like um, a little bit of a um, inconvenience when we see smoke in the area for these prescribed burns, but it's really important because of the soils and um, the peat that's here in these environments, we have to get rid of some of the fuel in, in those environments or we're at much higher risk for more catastrophic wildfires. Wildlife conservation. This is kind of a no-brainer for wildlife refuges, but the bottom line is we're creating a lot of habitat and just protection areas for a whole suite of species. Biodiversity. This is a kind of a big word, but I, I like it despite the, the jargon of it. Um, and what it really means, it's honestly, I think it's a simple concept. It's the interconnectedness. So it's how each part interacts and depends on the other in nature. And ecological communities that have high levels of biodiversity really are more stable. They are able to buffer themselves from environmental stressors and able to recover faster from disturbance. Clean air and water, things we take for granted, but Refuges can provide um, active filtration and purification. Cultural heritage. Some, uh, some uh, aspects of refuges are connecting us to our history, whether it's fossils, whether it's archeological evidence, whether it's artifacts or places like lighthouses. Economic benefits. I recently read a stat from a report that came out quite a few years ago, but I thought it was really interesting and I'd share with you. For every dollar that, the, that Congress allocates to the National Wildlife Refuge, um, five dollars uh, goes back into local economies through visits for recreation. I thought that was pretty substantial. So these are the kind of collective benefits of why refuges are important to me. But it's also really more simple. And it, the fact of it is, like, refuges, proper noun, big R refuges, are refuges, small r refuges. So they're a place where you can wander, you can wonder, and you can just kind of take a breath and look for your light. That said, there are some policies to keep that, all of those components sort of in place and available for everyone. So there are policies on refuges, policies and laws to follow when you're visiting refuges. And these really vary station to station. So I encourage you, if you have any questions, you can always look it up online or there's usually refuge policies posted when you enter a refuge on some signs. Generally, refuges are open sort of daylight hours. Um, like I said, the, the uses and activities vary by refuge. For example, at Pea Island, there's no hunting year, year round um, because of sort of the mission and purpose and, and, and animals, frankly, that use Pea Island. And it's a human safety issue. But at Alligator River, there are a lot of opportunities. So you can, um, you can get hunting and fishing permits for very, a lot of the refuges. I brought, I brought actually some tonight because many of these are self-issued. They're free and self-issued. There are some special events that are um, permit and fee-based, but if you're interested in that, I brought some this evening. There's also a series of activities that you need a special use permit for. And these are things like doing active research on refuges or doing any kind of like tours or commercial, um, commercial activity. 
And then there's even more specialized permits available for things like firewood collection or boat mooring. So if you have any questions about those, please contact one of our staff members and we'd be happy to tell you more. There are areas closed, um, not at all refuges, but the likelihood is high that there's at least some small area closed at somewhere you visit near here. And they're closed for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're just closed because of what's in it and we need to minimize disturbance in there. Some are closed very seasonally or temporarily, um, depending on activities in there or potential breeding activities, for example, on Pea Island on the beachfronts. So now I kind of wanted to explore what's here locally. And, and we're at a real advantage because in northeastern North Carolina, we have nine different refuges in our coastal refuge complex. And it's, it's pretty dense. So from um, sort of north to south, we have Mackey Island, Currituck, um, we, Alligator River, and Pea Island, which I'm going to talk about in more detail. Pocosin Lakes, um, Madame Mesquite, Swan Quarter, Cedar Island, and then Roanoke River in Bertie County. I've also just indicated well, here's where Edenton Fish Hatchery is and the Migratory Birds Office in Columbia. And I've indicated these with the blue goose. Does anybody know where the blue goose came from? Anybody want to volunteer that? Go ahead. It came from a gentleman named Ding Darling. That's correct. That's correct. So Ding Darling, um, I had to look up Ding's real name today. Jay Norwood, um, affectionately called Ding. Ding Darling was a conservationist um, proponent, but also a two-time Pulitzer winning cartoonist. And he created the blue goose as a symbol of the refuge system. So you'll see that kind of throughout the talk. Hint, hint for trivia later. <laughs> So I also kind of wanted to show the faces of Fish and Wildlife Service. So for nine stations um, in the complex, we're jointly administered um, through our kind of gateway visitor center in Ro um, on Roanoke Island. And uh, we're a small little group for nine stations. There's 40 staff. So that's not a whole lot of capacity. And what that means, quite simply, is some of those stations are unstaffed. So Cedar Island, Swan Quarter, and Currituck are unstaffed. Um, our project leaders, Rebecca Martin, Rebecca's here tonight. Can you just wave real quickly? Thank you. Um, and this is, uh, this, we just got all together last month, so this is a, our most recent group picture. Um, we are well supported by a friends group and a whole system of volunteers to help make up for that limited capacity that we have. Um, I cannot understate the importance of those partnerships. Um, but I also wanted to put up our photos because when I started with a federal agency, I was a little intimidated going into this sort of big organization. And I really didn't understand what it would mean for me in my local community. And what it means is really, you know, these are people that you're going to see every day. They're performing in your local theater productions. <laughs> They're coaching your kids' basketball teams. Like, we're all kind of living and breathing in the same community, dealing with the same challenges that you are. And I say that because there's going to be questions and issues that come up, and I want everyone to feel that they have the opportunity to see, to ask a question for someone they know. So I encourage you to stop by the visitor center. It's where, um, it's where our administrative offices are located as well. But explore the visitor center. It has a lot of opportunities in there too. So within our complex, there's sort of similar programs as the refuge system, everything from biology to um, law enforcement, maintenance, vis visitor services, fire management. But I'm really going to focus on um, what my team does in the biological program. And to do that, I'm just going to highlight some activities on, at two um, specific refuges, Alligator River and Pea Island. And we're going to dive into Alligator River first. 
So um, how many of you have been to Alligator River? Wonderful. So Alligator River is on mainland Dare and Hyde counties. It um, encompasses about 160,000 acres with the Dare County bombing range in the middle. That's about 46,000 acres um, uh, operated by the Air Force and also used for training exercises by the Navy. Um, Alligator River has a pretty rich history of use and kind of how it evolved. Um, it started, people originally sort of settled it for um, timber uses and that turned into sort of a paper company and then uh, a farming company and eventually um, Perillion Corporation, which was a combination of First Colony Farms and Prudential Life Insurance Company, donated this land in 1984 to the refuge system as facilitated by the Nature Conservancy. And it's a pretty special area because it contains not only a diversity of habitats, but a wide swath of undisturbed forest. And uh, this is a whole, and this and other habitats, lots of wetlands, pocosins, pine forests, salt marsh, and still operational farmlands. That's creating habitat for all types of species, including a whole host of birds and waterfowls, um, um, alligators, red wolves, black bears, lots of uh, neotropic migrants. It's a great time to start seeing warblers and it's a, it's a really neat place to see a lot of different species. There are alligators at Alligator River. <laughs> We're at the very northern range of the American alligator, so they're pretty slow growing, um, but there are a bunch of other things too, and here's sort of just a sampling of some of the wildlife you'll see on the refuge. The management priorities on the refuge are a little variable um, because we have so many different types of habitats. So it ranges from cooperative farming to managing wintering waterfowl to threatened and endangered management um, of things like red wolves. Because of where it is, and specifically because we're surrounded by water on three sides, Alligator River has really become a laboratory of ground zero for the impacts of climate change. So there are a lot of things happening to monitor the impacts of that. Um, here's just a couple things we do in-house. Um, it's a lot of, it, right now we're in the middle of waterfowl, winter waterfowl surveys. Um, also a lot of water management. The maintenance crew does a lot of heavy lifting for our water management. Um, tundra swan surveys, bat surveys, and surface elevation surveys, which are associated with kind of measuring erosion associated with some suspected climate change. Alligator River has some challenges um, in its management goals as well. And one of them this is sort of a one-two punch here because in this area, a lot of these lands have been ditch, systematically ditched and drained using a canal system and V-ditches, and that makes water, like the normal water movement in these habitats, really challenging. So here's one of the canals um, on the refuge adjacent to the farm fields, and this sort of blanket of green is an invasive species called alligator weed, which sort of exacerbates the challenge of draining water out of the canals when we want to. Um, another challenge, and this is really more common to the southeast in general, is we've, um, as we've developed this area, um, we've really disrupted the natural kind of wildfire um, and burning regime. And because of, and I mentioned this earlier, because those fuels tend to store in those especially peat and organic soils, the fires can, when they do start, and we, they do start often, as you all have seen through lightning strikes and wildfires we've had over the years, they tend to be hot and they have the potential to be catastrophic. So this is really challenging, especially because of the um, community interface with neighboring areas that we are trying to mitigate that through some regular prescribed burns. 
And then this, this photo is the, sh is the shoreline of Alligator River, and it, it sort of goes back to what I mentioned, how everything is really changing rapidly here as compared to other places inland. And what I mean by that is we really do see the impacts of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion um, almost in real time, it feels like, on Alligator River. So we are trying to look at mitigating some of those impacts because they're having huge um, additive sort of stressors into converting forest habitat to marsh, but also eroding the shoreline pretty significantly. So there's a lot of research happening at Alligator River and, most, and almost all of it is conducted by various partners. And I've just listed just a sampling of some projects that are ongoing and our partners who are conducting them, but it's everything from seasonal movement of alligators to a lot of um, these issues related to tracking climate change and thinking about coastal resiliency. So looking at how to restore the natural hyd hydrologic regime, how to measure impacts of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion, and to look at um, some of the carbon and water cycling of these natural forests as compared to nearby developed areas. There's also some really neat cultural studies going on. Sarah Parkin just um, finished her dissertation at um, East Carolina looking at some digital reconstructions of Buffalo City um, and also some night sky surveys that are looking at the impact of light pollution because it's pretty dark at Alligator River. So I wanted to focus on one specific project on Alligator River that um, I've uh, just participated in the slightest bit. Um, so uh, it's a big collaborative effort between um, Virginia Tech, University, USGS, um, the Department of Transportation, and uh, Copperhead Consulting. And it was looking at bats. So many bat populations, especially in the eastern U.S., are experiencing population declines rapidly um, as a result of a disease called white-nose syndrome. And because of the habitat diversity on Alligator River and the milder climate of the coastal plain, researchers have been investigating the bat populations here to see if they behave any differently than some of our cave-dwelling populations in the western part of the state. So we were really interested in first determining what bats were on the refuge, just doing a, a species inven inventory, and then seeing how they're using different habitats. And the way that we do that is through some passive acoustic monitoring. Here's a monitoring device that we stick out there for a while. We do mist netting where we catch them in hand. And then we also do radio telemetry. So these are two of um, the smaller bat species that we have on the refuge. This is the evening bat, and this is a red bat. So what did we find? Well, we found some, some pretty cool stuff. First of all, we found a lot of bats. So that was really exciting that we have a lot of species of bats on the refuge. And this is one of my favorites. Um, this is the northern long-eared bat as demonstrated by these big guys. Um, and this species was just recently listed in the past couple of years as threatened. So we're really interested in how this, this guy in particular are using these habitats in the coastal plain. And what we found is um, some seasonal differences. So there, we have a different, kind of different suite of bats um, in the fall versus in the spring. Uh, but these guys, the northern long-eared bats, tend to stay here year-round. And that is to their advantage because staying um, active and not going in any kind of arrested state, like something similar to hibernation or torpor, staying metabolically active actually helps them be more resilient to white-nose syndrome because they're warmer. 
So white nose syndrome is a fungus. It's kind of a cold-loving fungus. That's why it's really decimating cold bat, um, cave dwelling populations um, in the mountains. And hanging out here on the coastal plain, they're warm enough that want, they are not really becoming more susceptible to this. So that's, that was a really neat piece of information that we gained from this work. So they're also not moving around. They're here all year and they're using a whole host of trees, everything from red maple, um, and pine, but they're really fine. They're really enjoying roosting in black gums and water tubelows, which I thought was interesting. So these are small trees. They're not in these big populations um, in in large roosts. They're kind of a you know more solitary, and that's another um, another advantage to sort of uh, avoiding um, disease exposure as well. So. We have not detected any white nose so far. So this is ongoing, um, but I suspect because they're not colonial and because they're more active, um, hopefully they have these, um, these sort of characteristics to make them a little more resilient. So I'm gonna switch over to Pea Island. How many people have been to Pea Island? Yeah. How many people have been this week? <laughs> Michael. <laughs> So Pea Island um, is uh, a narrow strip of land um, just south of Oregon Inlet, and it, the bo our southern border ends really at Rodanthe, right at Merlot. And it's 5,800 land acres, um, but it's also, it has almost 26,000 acres of proclamation boundaries, um, boundary waters around the refuge. The refuge doesn't manage those waters. The state and the park service manages those waters, but they are sort of a, a refugia for a lot of migratory birds. And that both of those were set up, that boundary and the refuge itself was established in 1938 by executive order. So that's a little different than how Alligator River was established more contemporarily. So it is in the middle of um, Cape Hatteras National Seashore. The seashore was established in 53 after the refuge um, was established. So it is operated differently, but we partner on a lot of various things. Um, it's one of the most visited refuges in the country. We estimate that there's about 1.7 million visitors a year, and that's been growing over the past several years. For such a little stretch of land, it's got a lot of different habitats, everything from open water, oceanside dune, to marsh um, and salt flats on the other side. Um, because of where it's situated and how it is on the peninsula, we're kind of dead center, um, midpoint of the Atlantic Flyway, which is a migration corridor for a variety of animals. But how it sort of plays out in practices, you can see over 365 species of birds at Pea Island, and that's pretty exciting. You can also see marine mammals and sea turtles, and the management sort of varies from prescribed burning and um, seasonal area closures to managing more of the wetland habitats here. So just to point out, this is, this is a big flock of redheads. Um, the redheads have started to arrive already in Pea Island. And the peak, maybe the peak day that we see them, there could be 25,000 redheads in the impoundments. And it's a small area. The impoundments are only 800 acres. Um, and you may see 25,000 birds piled into a 400 acre pond. So it's a pretty, pretty exciting sight to see. Whoops. So here are some of those bird species that I mentioned. It's a whole variety of wintering waterfowl to sort of breeding colonial nesting water birds and shore birds in the summer. And then I had to sneak some turtles in. <laughs> Pea Island's pretty challenging too um, for really different reasons, but um, as many of you are aware of, it, 
it's hard to live and work on a barrier island system. These habitats are fragile um, and it's key to maintaining the transportation corridor um, that runs through the refuge and the seashore. So um, I wanted, this is from this week, um, and I just, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, the Department of Transportation. They're out there endlessly clearing um, the road and um, facilitating um, everything really down there related to the highway. Um, so it's a really tricky situation down there and it takes a lot of open communication between everybody. And this is, this, I can't find any other photos to demonstrate why coastal resiliency is important, more important than this. So this is gonna continue and this is gonna be an ongoing conversation in our community. So in terms of wildlife management priorities on Pea Island, it's mostly a place for the birds. So we're looking at wintering waterfowl habitats, breeding water bird habitats and shorebird habitats, and also focusing on some of the endangered species that are there. So in terms of monitoring, we do year-round bird monitoring at Pea Island. Most of the monitoring is focused on the impoundments for the water birds and waterfowl in the winter, but there are um, beach-wide uh, surveys all spring and summer, uh, and we see our shorebirds and waterbirds nesting and using these areas probably about six months of the year. So you will see these kind of temporary closures from um, in sort of the April to August time frame on the beach and it's because the birds are there and we're adaptively managing those areas as birds use them and don't use them. So these are again a sort of a example of research projects here um, on Pea Island. It, it's really variable but it kind of uh, keys in on the two things that is are most obvious there like managing migratory birds and also looking at issues of um, coastal geomorphology and coastal engineering. So one of the projects that I just wanted to highlight specifically is a project that's ongoing here at ECU and CSI. And this project is part of a larger ongoing collaborative effort with Department of Transportation and NC State. Um, as well as ECU. But this particular piece of it was looking at beach tree nourishment um, on the south end of the refuge and the impacts of that from efforts that happened in 2014. So in 2014, about a mile and a half of the southern part of the refuge was nourished, um, 1.3 million cubic yards, the, with a price tag of about $18 million. And um, here's JP and Reed, our co-PIs from um, ECU, and here's an aerial view of some of that effort. Um, and what that entails in terms of nourishment is um, sand from uh, different offshore sites are dredged up and put on the shoreline to widen um, the beach width in a particular area. And this is important to kind of match up because all this, there's the wide variety of sand. I never knew how much until I moved here. Um, but sa all sand is not created equal. And um, you really want to focus on trying to match up that sand because as best you can from these sites that you're um, dredging it from because the variance in sand size and the composition of the sand, um, the difference between this, these sites and where the sort of native sand is on the beach can potentially be really problematic both for coastal engineering. So if that sand isn't sort of well suited um, to each other, it makes the beach and dune really susceptible to 
um, erosion and full out loss post nourishment. Um, and then the biological aspects of that is if the sand isn't um, similar enough in grain size and mineral composition to the sand that's already on the beach, it can really impact the invertebrate community. And that has pretty big consequences for many of the foraging birds that are using that area. So here, here's some methodology um, that Reed and JP and, and team were using. So here's the very southern stretch of it. This is all where beach renourishment occurred and they were, had transets set up here and they compared it to sort of a, a suite of control areas further north. And you can see them sort of collecting invertebrates and doing some shoreline mapping here. So the initial results just came in last year and one of the take home messages is it's complicated. So um, there's a lot of variance, especially with seasonal differences, and you can all attest to this. You, our winter beaches look different than our spring and summer beaches, and, and that shows up in some of these analyses. But that said, we did see some initial differences in coquina and ghost crab populations between the two sand sources. What was interesting, um, now that we have seen a couple years past the nourishment event, is it really only provided about three years of mitigation. And that, you know, that is a cost benefit analysis for the price of the work versus the what, you know, the sort of buffer time that you get out of it. And what I mean by that is, since then, the beach width and the sand volume is back to original, if not lower, um, placement before the nourishment effort. So we need to do some more work on this to see sort of what the differences are. And Reed and Paul Paris are actually starting a longer term evaluation and they're gonna start this work this year. So this is sort of a to be continued story. From my perspective, I saw turtles come back right away and nest on these beaches post-nourishment. Um, they really like that southern stretch for whatever reason, probably because they do have quite a bit of site fidelity as well. But what I haven't seen are the birds nesting there. So that's still sort of an unknown. We need to look into that, um, whether it's other conditions of the beach or whether it may be some lack of availability in that invertebrate community. For my, la for my last research project, I wanted to kind of switch gears and focus on something a little bit different. This is also at Pea Island. Um, but it, whereas the other two research projects have been sort of active data collection in the field, this is a little bit different. So this is called a modus tower. And what it does is track wildlife movement. But it's very um, unique in that it's a passive, um, research network. So this is right behind um, the visitor center at Pea Island. This is a radio tower that was existing there. And what we did was attach four antennas onto the radio tower. And it allows um, any animal with a nanotag, and this little nanotag right here, um, and you can see it sort of kind of hanging out of the bird right here. Um, that is a, um, it's a small VHF um, radio transmitter that enables um, it to sort of ping when it flies past the tower. And it doesn't have to fly close. I think it, I think it only needs to be even, I think it's within 10 kilometers, so seven-ish miles. Um, so as it, and this is really exciting because of where Pea Island is, we're on that flyaway, it has potential to have a lot of birds pass it on their migration routes. So any birds or anything with these transmitters um, can ping off this tower. And I got really excited about this because it allows m multiple research projects to happen simultaneously. So um, it, it's sort of unique in that way to some of the other projects that we have on site. And it's passive, so you're only 
um, handling the animals once. So this was launched in 2013, um, the, the MODIS system overall. We just recently put this on Pea Island a couple years ago. But Bird Studies Canada has really been the proponent and um, the supporter of this, but um, lots of different research groups are using this system. And this is kind of how it works. So um, you have the tower set up, and here's the little nano tag on the bird, and it's been attached to monarch butterflies as well, but it's mostly on, we're seeing on neotropical migrants and on uh, my, but mostly migratory shorebirds. So as a bird completes its migration route, it's pinging off any tower that it passes um, as it's completing its journey. And it, it's giving all of those research groups information about how, how those movements are paced and where they're going. So there's now a network of over 500 stations, which is really exciting. A lot, there's high density in the Northeast because a, a lot of bird migrants use those areas as foraging and stopover grounds. But we are slowly expanding our shoreline and refuges has played a large role in this. So in our Southeastern region, we've um, slowly built a network in the last couple of years to really capture the whole, that part of the migration corridor. So these um, are listed sort of throughout South Carolina and Florida and here in North Carolina. And what, how this works is if you have, and anybody can set this up, you could set this up for under $1,000 here at CSI, which is really, I think, an exciting, affordable opportunity for a, to be part of a research network. But how this works is um, if you have cell, cellular service available, this, it, this does, it operates in real time. You can log on to modus.org and you can see as birds fly by them pinging into the network, which is very cool. Pea Island doesn't exactly have consistent cell service as a lot of some of these more remote refuges do. So it just has the added step of downloading manually the data and then they get kind of batch uploaded at once. So you won't see Pea Island's data in real time, but you'll see a lot of new information altogether at once. And this is sort of what it looks like when you log into the network. You see the refuge towers here and all of these circles with numbers in them. And that means that there were different numbers of pings recorded from different points of origin. So this 22 is probably, some of them are from the Cape May area. There's a lot of banding going on there. And we also get a lot of things from Chesapeake Bay. But the interesting ones that caught my eye were here. So when you click on that array, you get to see all of these different data points. So there were five data points in this cluster. And when you um, choose a specific data point, you get information about the bird itself. So when it was tagged, where it was tagged, and then when your tower detected it, which is pretty cool. So this turned out to be um, a sanderling that was tagged in the Arctic Circle. And We've picked it up a couple times, um, but I thought this was so impressive because sanderlings are kind of unassuming, generally unimpressive birds. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they're not our shorebird superstars. And, and I thought this was amazing because here is our quote unquote regular old sanderling traveling 2,500 miles from the Arctic Circle flying past Pea Island. Pea Island's not even its final destination. So it's going probably all the way to Argentina. But how exciting is that, that we get to capture that information? So I encourage you, go on modus.org. I printed out some fact sheets here as well. But this, this is updated all the time. And there's over 300 research projects using this information on these nano tags. And it's really cool. So what does this allow us to learn? It sort of informs us on 
how animals migrate, both their patterns of migration, where they're going, but when they're going. And these are really changing. So it's migration's changing both in latitude and in altitude and in phenology. So when, and you're seeing this in real time. You know, how you're seeing robins come into your yard earlier. You're seeing your flowers bloom earlier. With increasing temperatures, we're seeing changes in both plant and animal behavior. And, and this sort of drives some of that home in terms of migration dynamics. But it's also informing us on things that we wouldn't be able to track otherwise, just these large distance dispersals, how animals are feeding, where they're stopping, how they're using habitats, and some of their survival success. Um, it's informing things like that. Um, two different research groups have, uh, have tagged birds on Pea Island and on Currituck um, from UNCW and College of William and Mary. Uh, they're both kind of focused on salt marsh sparrow research, so those are kind of ongoing. So I just wanted to circle back to this. You know, I've sort of given you a really quick overview of all the research that, some of the research that happens uh, on refuges, and it's really a testament to all of our partners for facilitating this work. Um, these are just a few of them. I've obviously mentioned a lot of academic institutions as well. And here are some people that do it on the ground. So um, I have a small but mighty team, and I just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, Brian Van Druten is not here, but uh, he's worked with this agency for over 20 years, and I can't think of a harder working person than Brian. He is um, just my right-hand man all the time. Um, Lindsey Green. Lindsey, can you wave your hand? <laughs> Lindsay just joined us um, this spring and will be here throughout the summer season. Um, and I'm just highlighting a couple folks um, because they're here and I want to acknowledge them in person. Um, John Cece is a refuge volunteer. John, can you wave real quickly? Um, who's helped us with a lot of turtle work and bird work. Um, Mike Bryant, um, former project leader and now active re refuge volunteer, thank you. Um, Rebecca's here with Lindsay Addison. Lindsay Addison is with Autobahn and she travels nonstop around this state to help us band our birds. So um, she is just incredible, and I'm so grateful to her. She's really the reason why so many of you report birds to me, because they're banded. Um, and we also are supported by a ton of refuge volunteers and interns. Um, Elizabeth was here this summer and last summer with us. So how do you get involved if you want to get involved with refuges? How do you get involved? I think, well, many of you have already told me you spend time on a refuge, so you've already checked that first one, which is really exciting. Um, there's a lot of things to do on the refuges. I didn't talk about recreation really much at all or educational or outreach opportunities, but there are some special events, and one's coming up that I just wanted to plug. The Encore event for our birding festival, Wings Over Water, is December 6th through 8th. Um, there are quite a bit of different programs, uh, and they change seasonally, but I encourage you to look online. We, through the uh, fall and winter months, we do have monthly wolf howlings on Alligator River. And then you can visit a visitor center, um, either the kind of gateway visitor center on Roanoke Island, or all, most of these other stations have visitor centers as well that I encourage you to visit. If you have a school group, there are tour opportunities there's lots of volunteer opportunities. We're, we're well served by interns, resident work campers, and lots of seasonal help. And then there are um, very active friends groups, both locally through the Coastal Wildlife Refuge Society or nationally through the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Please let me know if you would like more information about any of those. There is some information on the side tables as well. And with that, I'll end. This is my contact information and where to find me. My office is in the Manio Visitor Center. Um, and you can also follow us on um, Facebook and other forms of social media. 
It's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in North Carolina. So thank you so much. Oh, tri we have trivia. I can't forget our trivia. So I have two trivia questions. Um, first of all, who could tell me the year that Pea Island was established as a refuge? 1938. 1938. You get a turtle. <laughs> All right. Um, the next. You guys are quick. The next question is: Who was the Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist who designed the Blue Goose? I can't see. I know people are waving, but I. Go ahead. Ding, darling. That's right. <laughs> what was his real name for bonus points? <laughs> Jay Norwood. That one's hard. I did, but it's <laughs> All right. I'm happy to take your questions. Um, for questions, uh, Parker's going to pass around the microphone so folks that are streaming can hear you as well. Thanks, Parker. Hi. Oh, that was a great talk. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in relation to the MODIS towers, how many birds have been tagged so far? How many would you, how many do you project will be tagged, let's say, between now and this time next year? And how do you catch the birds to tag them? Do you use mist netting like you do for bats or some other technique? Those are great questions. So let me, let me try to work through them. Um, one, I don't know how many birds are tagged because they're not all tagged on us. Um, so they're coming from lots of different places. Um, I could say how many are tagged on us. I know that we have tagged, I think, about 35 salt marsh sparrows this summer. Um, but most of the birds that we see coming through are from different places. So I'm not sure how many are in the network because there are so many projects that are simultaneously happening. But um, I could say ballpark how many birds we've seen come through on us and ping off the tower, and that's about, I think, 250. So, and that's I just, I think that's in the past three years. Yeah. Um, how we capture the birds. So that is really variable um, for the species. And some of it is mist netting for the smaller neotropical migrants, but other shorebirds are a whole variety of techniques. But yeah, good question. Um, not unless they can't fly. Like if, if, if pre-fledgling, um, that is one option for some of the smaller guys, but uh, everybody with flight is at an advantage. Great questions, thank you. Other questions? Okay, Parker's coming over. For your alligator research, do you guys tag the alligators to see if the population is getting big or how do you monitor them? That's a great question. So we, um, we really are relying on partners doing that work. And the person who's done all the, the literal heavy lifting on this is um, a, a researcher named Steve Dinkelacker. He's at Framingham University in Massachusetts, and he has looked at this um, not only on Alligator River, but along, all over the coastal plain here. And he does tag them. They are um, they're satellite trackers. Um, so he's looking at how, um, a couple different things. First of all, how they're moving, sort of what habitats they're using, how many there are. Um, we're at the very northern distribution of American alligators. And when you see, what I found so fascinating through his work was, when you see an alligator on the side of the road and it's 10 or 12 or 13 feet, because we have some big alligators here, um, that alligator's probably 50 years old. They're really slow growing here and they're not um, reproductively mature until they're about 25 or 30 years old and then they grow even slower. So um, because it's cool here and they're ectotherms, they grow, they're, it's even 
slow going here. But he's really looking at how they're using habitats, how they're moving around, and trying to get a, a population estimate for the refuge. But his work does feed a larger project um, in the coastal plain. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful and very informative. Um, it's not a very scientific question, but I've always wondered how it came to be that a bombing range got situated on a wildlife <laughs> refuge <laughs> and the stress that that causes to the animals, um, <sighs> both migratory and you know, year-round populations. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's a question I don't know the specific answer to, but I will speak to the idea of military bases near or um, adjacent to refuges because I've done a lot of work on Department of Defense lands for my work. And it's, it's kind of shocking that, um, yeah, when I first started it, because I've done a lot of work specifically on Fort Bragg and the Sand Hills here, and it, I was really surprised um, at the diversity of habitats there, mostly because that isn't an area that gets a lot of traffic generally from the public. There are a lot of training opportunities and same with the range, but there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of regular usage of that area. So some of those, it, it gives the juxtaposition of that we have these really pristine habitats on the range next to very high use habitats on the range, but it allows the diversity of habitats and species to really persist in a way that many other areas don't have. So I've been just increasingly surprised at the habitat and wildlife diversity on defense lands and am really eager to continue to work with partners there to, to kind of examine some of those questions. But there is some disturbance. Um, I think a lot of the animals probably mitigate themselves in their activity patterns to avoid some of those things, but other, other questions are still unanswered for sure. We have an online question. Sure. That question is, do you tag and monitor, and if so, what percentage of the black bear population at Alligator River? So did folks hear that? Did we, do we tag and monitor any black bears on Alligator River? Um, we, we have in the past, um, together with partners at um, Virginia Tech, but we have not recently. So most of the bear, there's a, occasionally I see an ear tag, um, but we, don't, we currently don't have any active radio collars and we're not actively tracking any bears on the refuge. Hey, uh, thanks for coming this evening. That was a excellent presentation. Um, a, a lot of people, a lot of communities on the Outer Banks are talking about the impact of coyotes on the Outer Banks. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, what is the impact you've seen in the uh, alligator wildlife refuge and how has that changed over the last five or 10 years? Great question. Thank you. I'm. I'm gonna pivot a little bit because I've actually seen more impact on Pea Island than on Alligator River, which is surprising to me. Um, and I suspect because I, just the habitat difference, it's easier to see them on Pea Island and some of those more open habitats versus some of the um, more covered forest and Pocosin habitats of Alligator River. I have no doubt they're at Alligator River, but I don't physically see, observe them as much as I do at Pea Island. So on Pea Island, I feel like even in the last three years, we're seeing um, an increased presence and subsequent pressure, predation pressure on some of our shorebird populations, for sure. Uh, there's a lot of research going on, and I was just curious uh, if the uh, service uh, announces when uh, things are published, uh, because you've got, what, 20 universities that you're working with, and it's all coming out of this area. 
And I think for some of us, that would be very interesting yeah. to know centrally when it's available. Thank you. That's a great question. I know it's the short answer. And, um, but um, I think there's opportunity there. Uh, so for each institution that applies to do research on either refuge, they have to go through what's called the special use permit process. And conditions of getting that permit are to let us know when, um, as sort of technical reports and scientific publications are available. We don't have a refuge specific um, sort of uh, storage area for that, but the service does, and it, it's called our service catalog. Um, we call it ServeCat for short, and we do upload final reports from our researchers and from internal um, monitoring programs onto that, and I would be happy to share that. That's publicly available, but it's not always an easy thing to search and find for specific refuges. So we're kind of working on creating sort of quick links from our local websites to that larger catalog of research and work. Great question. Other questions? Oh, yes, thanks for coming out. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and that's fires. Uh, I know that uh, the Nature Conservancy has been working on saltwater intrusion near the Point Peter area and some of the mitigating things that they've done out there. Uh, specifically, what, is, uh, what are you doing to plant either uh, salt tolerant plants uh, to uh, minimize the amount of fuel that's being caused by the saltwater intrusion? Great question. Um, I think, well, that's an ongoing process. So Point Peter is one of the areas that it's work, it's the work is mo most focused on. Um, and there's a lot of different collaborators there. Um, the Nature Conservancy has done quite a bit of research. Um, they were really at the forefront of that. But we also have partners from East Carolina, from Duke, from NC State, from UNC, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but there, it's, that is really part of the living laboratory, Point Peter. Um, a lot because of the proximity to the shoreline, but also because um, erosion is so obvious there. I mean, you could physically see it happen. Um, in terms of fire, we did do some plantings um, of different salt tolerant species. Um, there was quite a bit of Atlantic white cedar, put in there, but I think we did have some issues um, with some of the survival of some of those plants um, recently. So I think that's sort of an ongoing opportunity and body of work, so it's, it's kind of to be continued. Thank you. I'll keep you posted. Great. Thank you so much, Becky. I think do we have time for one more? Let's go to one more. One, one more question. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks. Um, how long do the transmitters last that are placed on the birds? Great question. Um, it's really variable, but on, on most of the smaller um, neotropical uh, migrants, it's about a year, um, which is pretty good for something that small um, that needs general batter, battery maintenance. Um, but yeah, so we're hoping the technology can continue to improve. Um, but right now, that's kind of the limiting factor. Okay. We, could, we could probably get more battery life out of them if they were larger, but we don't want to make the birds any, at any disadvantage. Just wondering how long it took that bird to fly that far north. Or, that was, I, were, well, that's a nor normal migratory route. So um, I don't, but we could track that in the yeah. system so we can look it up. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for all your questions, and thank you for visiting with us tonight. Thank you.